It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Well, good morning, Bethany Christian Church. Good morning. All right, we got some energy in the house today. Sun's out, right? It's a good day. Well, let me be the first to say welcome to Bethany Christian Church. There's a lot of places you could choose to be on a Sunday, but I am very happy that you chose to be with us this morning. Big welcome to Robert's family. Thanks for being here, guys. Good to see you. I think they, I think they snuck in here when I was sick one Sunday, and I, I finally got to meet them, so I'm, I'm excited to meet uh, all of your wonderful kids and grandkids, Robert. Um, so as many of you know, last week, we finished up our vision series for 2024 called Bridge, where we're talking about, starting a conversation about building a bridge between our church community and the immediate community here in Fort Washington, Camp Springs, Maryland. And in order to do so, we had a blueprint, right? We talked about the bridge that we're building, who we need to become in order to cross that bridge, and who we're going to be when we arrive on the other side. And in doing so, we came up with this thing called a discipleship path, asking the question week after week, what is my next step in my walk with God? And so our discipleship path had four steps to it. Connect, grow, serve, and share. Connect with who, with what? We connect with other believers. We are necessarily called as children of God, as disciples of Jesus, to be in community with one another. So that we can grow. We can grow in our faith. We can grow in our knowledge, our understanding, and our embodiment of the gospel. So that we might serve. Serve who? Serve what? So that we might serve the church. So that we might serve Fort Washington, Camp Springs, and the people that we come into contact with in our everyday lives. And in doing so, in connecting, in growing, and in serving, we communicate the greatest news that has ever come to the world. We get to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people, not only in word, but in deed. And so that's the context we're entering this second week of Lent with. Now, as I think of Lent, I feel like it's almost like New Year's resolutions. You know, most people actually give up on New Year's resolutions like two weeks into January. You know that's statistically the case, right? And so... We're actually entering our second Sunday of Lent, so we're about to enter the, you know, two and a half weeks here now, 
And maybe some of you decided for the season of Lent that you were going to give something up or that you were going to commit to a practice. And so this is the time that you're most likely to give up. And so I want to encourage you today before we jump into our word today. Persevere. Lean into God. It's in the wilderness that you will truly find God. It's in the barren places that you find the everlasting spring of water that Jesus promises the woman at the well. It's where life is found. And so as we continue on in Lent, I would encourage you to lean in, persevere, challenge yourself, and don't give up. So with that in mind, let us bow our heads in prayer and ask God to speak to us today. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called us out into the wilderness this season. Here in the barren places, the forsaken places, the places where civilization is a distant memory, somehow, some way, we find you. The prophet Hosea tells us that you will allure us into the wilderness and speak tenderly to us. So over the next 40 days and 40 nights, may it be so, may we enter the wilderness to bear witness to your still, small voice. May we leave behind distraction and embrace faith. May we draw near to you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm so excited about this message today. This is one of my favorite stories. So as you know, today we're talking about Romans chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul references Abraham. Now historically, Abraham is known to the Jewish people, to Islam, and to Christianity as the father of the faith, or the father of faith. Now as many of you know, Abraham's first title comes from the fact that God made Abraham a promise when his, st- his name was still Abram. Before he becomes Abraham, God promises Abram and his wife Sarai that God is going to make them into a great nation. And that sounds great and all, but as many of you probably remember from the story, there's a, there's a bit of a problem with God's promise to Abram and to Sarai. God is making a promise to them that's impossible. God is promising that Abram and Sarai are going to have a kid when they're in their late 60s and mid-70s. Not only that, but after God makes this promise, they try to conceive for almost 25 years. In the middle of all of this, Abram and Sarai have a conversation about how it's just not working. And so they agree that Abram should try to have a child with Sarai's servant, Hagar. They both essentially say, Hey God, I know you told us that Sarai was going to have a baby, but it's, it's not working. Clearly you meant for Abram to have a child with our servant, Hagar. I mean, ob- that's the obvious choice, right? And you know, it makes me wonder... How many times that you and I, how many times we've heard God promise something to us and we twist it to fit our plans? We had hope, but only in the conditions that the world can afford us. We just had worldly hope. Am I right? Like Abram, God promised and asked us to wait for a miracle. But we said, No, God, I know better than you. My timeline's better. I'm ready for this blessing right now. I'm going to make the promise come early. But it doesn't work like that, does it? But we still choose worldly hope over and over and over again. So when I was doing this reading for today, when I was preparing for Sunday, I... I, got stopped in my tracks by this weird phrase that Paul uses. And it stopped me in my tracks when I was looking over this passage because 
Paul says in verse 18 that Abraham is hoping against hope. That Abraham is hoping against hope. Now, when I was reading this last week, I was reading from the New Revised Standard Version, a different translation than what we have in our pew Bibles. So I'm going to read that for you today from the New Revised Standard Version. So I would encourage you, feel free to read along with me in your pew Bibles. That's going to be on page 1093 if you're looking. But listen to the words of this other translation I read to you. I'm going to pause when I get to that part that stopped me in my tracks because I want you to experience what stopped me. I want you to experience what inspired today's word, okay? So if you'd like to follow along, we're in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, and it goes like this. For the promise that he would inherit, that Abraham would inherit, The world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope. Hoping against hope. Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. Hoping against hope. But Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old at the time. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No, distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who trust in, adhere to, and rely upon him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It says, hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. So, pastor, what the heck does it mean to hope against hope? And that sounds crazy. How can I have a hope against hope? Well, after doing a little research, I learned that Paul is, what he's getting at here is that Abraham had a hope in something that was actually greater than hope itself. What does that mean? Well, Abraham had faith. Abraham had a hope that can only come from the encounter between a person and God. Abraham discovered throughout the course of his life what faith was. It wasn't instant. It took some time. So how did he get there? Well, remember we talked about Hagar, right? Before Abram and Sarai are given their new names, they make an important decision. After hearing God's promise, they try for years, years to have a baby. And it just doesn't work out. And unsurprisingly, they lose hope. I mean, frankly, who could blame them? They get this promise from God when Abraham is 75 years old and Sarai is 66 years old. I wonder how easy is it for us to have the same experience? We go to church on Sunday, we hear a great sermon, or we have a really special encounter with a friend or a loved one. We're high on life. 
But then, reality hits. Reality hits. And we realize that we've got limitations. Maybe it's age, maybe it's health, maybe it's finances, your intelligence, I don't know. Whatever it is, you know what your limitations are. And you know that you feel hopeless sometimes. I feel it too. And we both know that you and I, we've got these limits on us. And just like Abram and Sarai, we reach the end of our rope and we're desperate to find a way to get that promise that God wants to give us. And so we do what we can to work with the kind of hope that we've got. We go to Hagar. And we find that it's going to work. But not in the way that God originally had hoped for us. Right? And so as a result, we make decisions. People get hurt. God's promises aren't fulfilled. And we find that the thing we needed the whole time was maybe a little patience and faith. We needed faith. Abram having a child with Hagar is giving in to a false hope. It's worldly hope. That's not faith. Abram is not the father of faith yet. He's not Abraham yet. I mean, this is Abram running on worldly hope. But something happens in the lives of Abram and Sarai that transforms them forever. 24 years, 24 years after Abram makes his covenant with God, God returns to speak with Abram. And God tells him when Abram is 99 years old that his wife, at 90 years old, will bear a son. God then renames them Abraham and Sarah. And at 91 years old, Sarah gives birth to their child, Isaac. A miracle happens. And then some time passes after this miracle. Isaac grows to be a teenager. And then God gives Abraham the most ludicrous, the strangest command that has probably ever been written in the Bible. As many of you know, God says this to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. He says, take your son, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah with him. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Uh, pastor? That's crazy. It's okay. You can call it crazy. Call it what it is. Why would God say that? I don't have an answer for you. I'm not sure. But what I do know is that this is where Abraham becomes the father of faith. This is where he gets that second title we talked about earlier. Abraham takes the leap of faith by fully intending to follow God's command. In this moment of Abraham's life, he knew two things to be true. The first is this. He knew that God had made a promise to him. He knew that God had made a holy covenant with him and his wife Sarah. He knew that God was going to make their family into a great nation. But he also knew the second thing. He knew that God had just commanded him to destroy any chance of that happening by sacrificing his son as a burnt offering on top of a mountain. For those of you who don't exactly know about burnt offerings, a burnt offering to God was typically an animal sacrifice. It was a ritual where a person would sacrifice one of their most prized possessions, the greatest animal in whatever flock they happened to have. And they would burn it on an altar as an act of worship to God. And thank God we don't have to do that anymore. (laughs) It sounds kind of messy, right? But this time, 
It's a little different. God asks for Abraham's son. And as I'm sure you noticed, this doesn't make any sense. God is asking for Abraham's only chance at becoming the father of a great nation. I mean, look, he's a hundred years old now. I don't think he's going to be having any more kids with Sarah. I mean, it's a miracle that it took them 25 years in the first place, and they, they still succeeded 25 years later. But this is God's command. And so Abraham gets up the next day. He packs up his things. He takes Isaac on this long trip to Mount Moriah. And that's where they go. The theologian Soren Kierkegaard, when he reflects on this passage, he says this, the ethical expression for what Abraham did is that he meant to murder Isaac. The religious expression is that he meant to sacrifice Isaac. But it's precisely in this contradiction that we find the anxiety that can make a person sleepless. And yet without this anxiety, Abraham is not who he is. Without this anxiety, Abraham is not who he is. He's not the father of faith. Kierkegaard is saying, okay, so let's talk about the morals of what's happening here. Abraham fully intends to murder his son. If we take God out of the equation and we just look at Abraham, we see that all he's intending to do is to murder his son. Now, if we add God back into the equation, the religious expression, we see that Abraham intends to sacrifice Isaac. But either way you slice it, it doesn't look good, right? And even for Abraham, I mean, could you imagine the anxiety, the fear that he's experiencing on that trip to the mountain with Isaac? He's probably trying to find every excuse he can come up with in his mind not to go through with it. He's carrying this anxiety with him morning, noon, and night. God commanded him to kill his only son. He can't sleep. Sarah and Isaac probably saw the look on Abraham's face. Maybe they tried to ask him about what he was going through. But he knew that nobody could comfort him. Somehow he knew that he was supposed to follow through with this command. But he also knew that somehow God was going to make a way. My friends, that is faith. Kierkegaard says that faith begins precisely where thinking le leaves off. He says that faith's paradox is this, that the single individual is higher than the universal. That the single individual determines his relation to the universal through his relation to God. The single individual determines his relation to the universal through his relation to God. Not the other way around. Not his relation to God through his relation to the universal. And unless this is how it is, faith has no place in existence. And faith, then, is a temptation. To put it a little bit more simply, what Kierkegaard is teaching us is that faith doesn't make any sense because true faith breaks our understanding of what it means to do the right thing. You following me? Your relationship with God is what determines right and wrong, not the other way around. What he's saying is that we can't understand what the good is or what faith is until we go to God. We can't go to our morals first and then to God. That's having it backwards. That's having it twisted. You have to go to God to understand what the right decision is. We have to go to God first and then to our morals. And the proof is right here in the story of Abraham. Abraham 
the one that we refer to as the father of faith, is by all accounts about to do the wrong thing. Am I right? He's about to commit murder. He's about to betray his wife by killing their only son. He's about to forsake his family. He's about to forsake his promise to God. And he's about to throw away his legacy. In this moment, Abraham enters the paradox of faith. He's ready to give up everything and be lost to time. That's faith. It's in that the Bible says that true life is found. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He goes on to say, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Whoever finds their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for the sake of Jesus will actually find true life. This is what faith is. Jesus says, lose your life and you're going to find true life. The leap of faith is when you give up everything for God's sake. But in doing so, you actually gain everything back. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what God is saying. Get ready to sacrifice your son. God is saying to us, get ready to give up your entire world, and in doing so, you're going to gain everything back. Coming from another place in the Bible, if you'd like to turn with me in your pew Bibles to page 1173, James puts it another way. We're going to be reading from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 24. You'll see in your pew Bible, it's indicated by the title, Faith and Deeds, down towards the bottom of the page. And so this is what the letter, to James, letter from James says to us. Faith and deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You who are foolish... Do you want evidence of what faith of that faith without deeds is useless? Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Again, it says his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what they do and not by faith alone. What this is telling us is that faith alone isn't faith at all. Right? If we want to follow Abraham's example, the father of faith, hoping against hope, 
We have to be willing to take the leap. We have to be willing to follow the spirit that has driven us into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy of our souls. We have to trust that any worldly hope we could possibly have will pale into comparison to what God is trying to give us. The Bible says that worldly hope has no place where faith is concerned. Because it's hoping against hope. And so as we continue on our journey through the season of Lent, I'd encourage you to ask some questions of yourself. How is God prompting you to faith? What is God calling you and I to do for others? What relationships is God encouraging us to form, even when it appears to be a lost cause? How is God prompting us to take the leap of faith, to step out of our comfort zone, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a world that so desperately needs the love of God? Amen.